What's up, buddies? And buddy girls. So last night, um, I think around. just want to thank you all um, for all your support. It really means a lot to me. Um, even the quiet people who just lurk and watch videos, I truly appreciate it. audience in these past six or eight months, I think. Um, so I'm happy about that. It's, I'm still, look, I look at my channel and see the thousand, and it's hard to believe that a thousand subscribers now. Um, I know it's not like a huge number, but I don't, I try not to base my channel, or I try not to compare my channel to um, really popular channels, just because So I can just base, um, I, I only have the experience of this amount of subscribers and, but to me that's a lot of people, especially if you think about it in, if you think about it in the way that I try to think about it, um, I always think like, wow, a thousand people who watch my videos and like them enough to subscribe to me. That's like having a room filled with a thousand people just watching your video or listening you, what goal do you think we should set? think we 
such as bees and wasps, evolved at about the same time as the angiosperms. It was frequently cited as an example of coevolution. New research, however, indicates that insect pollination was probably well established before the first flowers. While the oldest bee fossil was trapped in its amber prison only about 80 million years ago, evidence has been found that bee or wasp-like insects built hive-like nests in what is now called the Petrified Forest in Arizona. These nests, found by Stephen Asiotis and his team from the University of Colorado, are at least 207 million years old. It is now thought that the competition for insect attention probably facilitated the relatively rapid success and diversification of the flowering plants. As diverse flower forms lured insects to pollinate them, insects adopt, adapted to differing ways of gathering nectar and moving pollen, thus setting up the intricate co-evolutionary systems we are familiar with today. limited evidence that dinosaurs ate angiosperms. Two dinosaur coprolites fossilized excrements discovered in Utah contained fragments of angiosperm wood, according to an unpublished study. This finding, as well as others including an early Cretaceous ankylosaur fossilized angiosperm fruit in its gut suggests that some paleo beasts ate flowering plants. Moreover, the shape of some teeth from Cretaceous animals suggests that the herbivores grazed on leaves and twigs. Cretaceous period animals During the Cretaceous period, more ancient birds took flight, joining the pterosaurs in the air. The origin of flight is debated by many experts. In the trees down theory, is it is thought that small reptiles may have evolved flight from gliding behaviors in the ground up. Hypothesis, flight may have evolved from the ability of small theropods to leap high to grasp prey. Feathers probably evolved from early body coverings whose primary function at least at first, was thermoregulation. Now, I'm not sure about this, but I think recently they were saying that dinosaurs had feathers, like a lot of dinosaurs, or all of them, or something. So, I'm not sure if this is... like the most up-to-date, but, and I'm not even sure if that's completely true, but I know I've heard something about that, which, if that's true, then Jurassic Park movies all need to be changed. <laughs> At any rate, it is clear that avian were highly successful and became widely diversified during the Cretaceous. Con the Cretaceous Confuci 
anxious soreness. 125 million to 140 million years ago. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing any words. Was a crow-sized bird with a modern beak, but enormous claws at the tips of the wings. Aparamasornis, a contemporary, only the size of a sparrow, was capable of flight and was probably an, an insectivore. By the end of the Jurassic, some of the large sauropods, such as Apatosaurus and Diplo Diplodocus, went extinct. Giant sauropods, including the titan titanosaurs, flourished, uh, especially toward the end of the Cretaceous. Large herds of herbivores, ornith ornithischians, that's a hard word, also thrived during the Cretaceous, such as Iguanodon. A genus that includes duck-billed dinosaurs, also known as hadrosaurs, ankylosaurs, and the ceratopsians, theropods, including Tyrannosaurus rex, continued as apex predators until the end of the Cretaceous. K dash P extinction event. About 65.5 million years ago, nearly all large vertebrates and many tropical invertebrates became extinct in what was clearly a geological, climactic, climatic, and biological event with worldwide consequences. Geologists call it the KPG extinction event because it marks the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogen periods. The event was formally known as the Cretaceous Tertiary or KT event. International Commission's a Commission on Stratigraphy, which sets standards and boundaries for the geological geologic timescale, now discourages, discourages the use of the term tertiary. The K is from the German word for Cretaceous. In 1979, a geologist who was studying rock layers between the Cretaceous and Paleogen periods spotted a thin layer of gray clay separating the two eras. Other scientists found this gray layer all over the world, and tests showed that it contained high concentrations of iridium, an element that is rare on Earth but common in most meteorites. Also within this layer are indi indications of shocked quartz and tiny glass-like globes called tectites that form when rock is suddenly vaporized, then immediately cooled, as happens when an extraterrestrial object strikes the earth with great force. The Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan dates precisely to this time. The crater site is more than 110 miles or 180 kilometers in diameter, and the chemical analysis shows that the sedimentary rock of the area was melted and mixed together by temperatures consistent with the blast impact of an asteroid about six miles across striking the earth at this point. When the asteroid collided with earth, its impact triggered shock waves, ma 
massive tsunamis and sent a large cloud of hot rock and dust into the atmosphere. As the superheated debris fell back to earth, they started forest fires and increased temperatures. This rain of hot dust raised global temperatures for hours after the impact and cooked alive animals that were too large to seek shelter. Small animals that could shelter underground, underwater, or perhaps in caves or large tree trunks may have been able to survive this initial heat blast. Tiny fragments likely stayed in the atmosphere, possibly blocking part of the sun's ray for months or years. With less sunlight, plants and the animals dependent on them would have died. Furthermore, the reduced sunlight would have lowered global temperatures in bearing large active animals with high energy needs. Smaller omnivores, terrestrial animals like mammals, lizards, turtles, or birds may have been able to survive as scavengers feeding on the carcasses of dead dinosaurs, fungi, roots, and decaying plant matter, while smaller animals with lower metabolisms were best able to wait the disaster out. There is also evidence that a series of huge volcanic eruptions at the, de the Deccan Traps located along the de tectonic border between India and Asia began just before the KBG event boundary. It is likely that these regional cat catastrophes combined to precipitate a mass extinction. The Cretaceous Period Climate The world was a warmer place during the Cretaceous Period. The poles were cooler than the lower latitudes, but overall were warmer. Fossils of tropical plants and ferns support this idea. Animals lived all over, even in colder areas. For instance, Hadrosaurus fossils dating to the late Cretaceous were uncovered in Alaska. When the asteroid hit, the world likely experienced a so-called nuclear winter when particles blocked many of the sun's rays from hitting Earth. And that's all I have for this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed this little mini-series about the Mesozoic era. Um, I enjoyed making it. I I've always been interested in like dinosaurs in the Jurassic um, period. So it was fun making these and relearning some stuff that I knew in the past and learning new things as well. Um, I don't know if I, I don't think I have anything, anything set for this Vax Friday video, if someone has a, an idea that they want and you're still listening at this point, then let me know. And if you let me know before I record the Vax Friday video, maybe I will your idea. And if there's a bunch of people that give me an idea for Vax Friday, I will pick one randomly or something. Um, I think that's it. And sorry if you don't like the mouth sounds from the candy I have in my mouth. I won't do it next time. 